Hello, this video is part two to the one I did a few days ago asking uh, whether uh, the, the invasion and um, other things the authorities are doing towards us are a conspiracy and whether they might conspire to impose a, a global dictatorship on us a la WEF or the G20 or the UN or um, uh, the Bank of International Settlements. And uh, this is the... Uh, that's, that was part one, and I focus there a bit on that fella, Matt Warman. Uh, he's the MP in Skegness, and uh, w what I'd like to, w to warn about, warn against there, following on from my video previously. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to single him out or to scapegoat him or to try and nail him for it. Uh, whilst his um, his way of talking is, um, he has this peculiar effrontery that I find so offensive. I find every, everything about what he's saying. Personally, I, I find it um, quite offensive. But um, he is at least coming forward and being open about it, saying it in public. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that pretty much every MP in the House of Commons, I can't think of a single exception, uh, that, that they, they all agree with him and think the same things. But most of them are just keeping quiet about it and acting on it on the sly. He's at least coming out and sticking it to us. So to, to the extent that you scapegoat him, it's probably um, a waste of effort and certainly a distraction from doing what is needed, which is what people are not doing, what we are not doing, which is thinking out how we can undo the damage that our, authority, our authorities have done to us and are continuing to do by imposing, amongst other things, the, the mass invasion on us. But um, I say again, all other MPs think the same or worse. And so, so that leads me to say, yeah, I think there is an element of conspiracy here. I don't think it's simple stupidity, weakness or incompetence. Stupidity, weakness and incompetence tend to be random. They tend to be variable. They tend to um, fall anywhere along the spectrum. They don't all occur all in the same direction, all in uni unison, right across the whole of the Western world, as is happening certainly with, with the, the, mass, uh, the, the mass migration invasion. And just to recap, uh, I think it's a, 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 I, I think you can call it a conspiracy, but it's a stu it's an it's a conspiracy without thought, and it's a conspiracy that rides the wave, that rides on the back of what we are prepared to tolerate of our own public attitudes. Uh, it's it's not it, it's not really the cliche of um, supremely powerful men going into a concrete bunker and thinking out how to control every aspect of the world. It is um, weak, stupid, inconsequential people not really thinking but are being obsessed, addicted to power and, and pursuing their own aims. It's about self-serving people grouping together in order to, to serve themselves, to serve their own interests, to do what they want to do, which is what most of us do a lot of the time. But people who are um, uh, uh, addicted to power will do um, pretty much all the time. And I, th I think that that defines most MPs, most people in the political class, and actually quite a lot of people in the, the apparatchik class, the hanger-on class, civil servants and local council officers, where the butler is more regal than the king. Now, what I want to go through is some of the, the verbal tangles that some uh, self-styled intellectuals uh, are, are getting themselves into in order tr to try and think their, w their way through this. And uh, what I'll start with, um, if I start with this one, if I go here. Now, a good place to start is this podcast between uh, Dr. Mike Yaden. He used to work for Pfizer and he became a critic of the uh, injections, let, let, let's call them. Interestingly, uh, th this is uh, talk about conspiracy. That has arisen on the back of um, the universal bad decision making uh, uh, and, or counterproductive, harmful decision making uh, that, and crazy decision making that uh, uh, our authorities seem to make in unison. Again, it's the universality of the stupidity that has led people uh, uh, around the health issue that takes uh, takes its name from the year 2019 and begins with the letter Charlie. And uh, those decisions and the way that everyone in authority went along with them uh, with complete enthusiasm, even though they were demonstrably bad decisions at the time, they, they, 
that is causing people to say, well, maybe there was some kind of conspiracy. But people don't like to be labelled as conspiracy theorists. So people are having to think their way around it and tie themselves in verbal knots. And a good place to start here is uh, this uh, th- this podcast between Dr. Mike Yaden and James Dellingpole. He's written quite a lot about um, uh, uh, um, environmentalism. It, again, he's anti the environmental scare. So uh, um, I'll just play you this little bit. It's about a minute, a minute and a half. I hope you can hear this okay. Uh, and then I think uh, there are some people who uh, you just enjoy, you know, the power that they get by having information and being able to scare you with it. But so I don't, think, I don't. In case people think, oh, is this a conspiracy? I don't think so. Um, but I do think that converging opportunism has happened sometime in the middle of the year, and it's happening now. I, I like your phrase, mm. converging opportunism. Mm. Convergent opportunism. You're right. That, yeah, that, that, I think that's it, it would. If this were a conspiracy, it would be the most impressive conspiracy in the world because it would require so many parties acting in cahoots with one another. And how would you do that? I mean, I, mean, I, do, I do think that the scare about the, the, the virus has been manufactured. But the idea that it's been cynically manufactured by, by an evil cabal, mm. I think it, it, it reminds me very much, I, I, as you probably know, I wrote a book about about the, the the environmental scare, you know, global ah. warming, and so on. Okay. And I've seen the same the same movements, the same currents. Um, it's and, and I said it's not a conspiracy; it's a concatenation of shared interests. That's it. I like that. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Convergent opportunism. Yes. Same thing. Exactly. Exactly. Can I ask you? Yeah. I... Okay. Convergent opportunism and a concatenation of interests there. That is two wordsmiths going at each other. And and what they're displaying is really common, is, is people uh, really bending over backwards not to want to be labelled as conspiracy theorists. They want to say there is some kind of, there's, some in, there's an intention about this, there's a motivation behind this, it's kind of planned out, people are sort of um, doing this deliberately and they're doing it together, but I'm not a conspiracy theorist. So, so you, that's where people people are t- um, tying themselves in knots and get, get, getting into contortions about it. And uh, the, the, the other thing they're trying to say is uh, these people are not shaping the world, they're just working with, 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 with the material that's there, the, the opportunities are there, the, the, the public attitudes that, that prevail. That's what they're writing, they're doing. And, 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 and this is what, what I think is happening. You have people in power, they're not thinking it through very deeply, they don't have control o- over us, they're simply taking the opportunities, they're doing what we will let them do. So that ultimately, ultimately, the problem is not out there. There's no one out there that we can really um, get if we want to solve this. Ultimately, the problem is in us. The problem comes out of us and what we will permit others to to to, to do to us. And what, what I think the mechanism is that with any big organisation, the bigger it gets, the more it will tend to serve the interests of the people who run it rather than the people that it's intended to serve. And as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that will become more and more the case until uh, uh, the, the people it's intended to serve, their interests become, or until the system becomes hostile to the interests of the people it's intended to serve. And until the people it's intended to serve effectively become an enemy. You can see that in extreme cases like under Stalin or under Mao. The, the, the interests of the ordinary guy were to be crushed and ground down uh, um, and the, um, the more ruthlessly. Uh, or that the 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 the, the uh, weaker they were, the more ruthlessly they would be suppressed. It, it's not like that now, and it's still fair to say that we, because we live in a, a democracy, we are allowing them. We are allowing them to do this. But the the phrases used by Mike, Dr. Mike Yade and, and James Dellingpole, th- those phrases, those are clever phrases. Uh, uh, Convergent opportunism and concatenation of interests. Opportunism, that's a five syllable word. And concatenation, and uh, two five syllable words there, that's clever. That's, well, they, they must be right if they can use big long words like that. Now, the, the next one I, I, I want to look at is um, th- this is something from, from a few years ago, which I thought was probably relevant. That, that's this um, 
uh, if I just show, show you this here, that's uh, Jeremy Falk, The Silent Conspiracy. That's a fellow called Tom Mangle, working for the BBC. What, what he's talking about is the way that the authorities seemed to almost to, to conspire to allow Jeremy Falk, one of their own, to, to get away with things throughout the whole of the 60s until he just um, went out of control in the early 70s. And um, it's um, um, what um, Mangold eventually uh, c c came, came up with is uh, uh, what he said was, hold on, he talked about, um, oh, it's a conspiracy without conspirators, a silent conspiracy based on assumption, custom, and instinct that was how things used to work well yeah it still works like that it still works like that now tom and a conspiracy without conspirators again that's um clever that's wordsmithing that's that's you sound, sounding clever you don't get conspiracies without conspirators i think what he means is uh, again it's a conspiracy but people just weren't thinking very hard and um, they weren't all powerful it's just people uh, um doing what they want to do which is not undermining the system which they feel comfortable in uh, by uh, uh, going at a man like Jeremy Thorpe. Now another one I want to look at that's that been, been pointed up is, is this fella, very unpleasant man, Michel Foucault, a postmodernist. I think postmodernism, I don't know a lot about it, but I think it was basically about, um, in the same way I think the, the, the Frankfurt School was about trying to slip Marxism uh, um, sort of under the back door and the, the Frankfurt School I think it was about trying to loosen our grip on reality um, via the back door and uh, Foucault was a pretty a, a big name in that group and and, and uh, he talked about um, uh, intentional non-subjectivity that, uh, that those in power they acted intentionally but non-subjectively again total load of nonsense I'll read you a bit of the quote here There's that's the Foucault website God knows who has the misfortune to run that Must, um, but uh, let's I mean you but but this does not mean that it results from the choice or decision of an individual subject. Let us not look for the headquarters that presides over its rationality, neither the caste which governs, nor the groups which control the state apparatus, nor those who make the most important economic decisions, etc., etc., etc. And if you go further down, the logic is perfectly clear, and then he makes it really unclear. But anyway, the logic is perfectly clear. The aim's decipherable, and yet it is often the case that no one is there to have invented them, and few who can be said to have formulated them, an implicit characteristic of the great anonymous, almost unspoken strategies which coordinate the loquacious tactics, whose inventors or decision makers are often without hypocrisy. Right, I feel stupider for having read that out. My IQ has got lower. Again, I, I I think that is he's trying he's he's a Marxist basically he likes Marxism and I think he, he wants to he wants to kind of push Marxist ideas but he doesn't want to be labelled as a Marxist so he doesn't want to talk he doesn't want to seem like a, a full on conspiracy theorist so he's coming up with this idea that um, people seek power and pursue uh, um, and power based conspiracies because they uh, they um, or they, they conspire to get more power in an intentional way but non-subjectively which really means that they don't have complete control over everything they're riding the uh, the back of the wave they can't they can't govern every detail of our lives they're they're like sort of fleas on the back of the dog they're acting intentionally but without total control again th this comes down to my view that th these are a bunch of chances or people in power are a bunch of chances who are self-serving, grouping together in order to do what they want to do. And that phrases like um, concatenation of, in, of interests and convergent opportunism and non-subjective intentionality, it, it doesn't work. I mean, to, to, to give, um, to give a, um, uh, an example, uh, Muslim taxi drivers historically have had a habit of uh, hanging around outside school gates in order to pick up and seduce and then eventually rape and enslave and um, make and addict uh, uh, and prostitute out uh, and sexually destroy uh, young girls 12 13 14 year old girls they have a habit of doing that now if um if by chance it didn't happen that you had decent coppers outside those schools or decent child protection workers doing anything about it. But let's suppose a decent um, 
uh, um, uh, um, sincere cop with a heartfelt conviction to preserving law, law and order had gone outside those schools to do something about it. He, he wouldn't have walked up to, he wouldn't have knocked on the window of those Muslim taxi drivers, the cousins, brothers, colleagues, uncles and nephews who, who were involved in it. He wouldn't have gone up to them and said, Ilu, Ilu, I think there appears to be a concatenation of interests going on here. I'm arresting you on suspicion of convergent opportunism in the furtherance of non-subjective intentionality anything you say may be taken down against you I mean he, he wouldn't have done that he'd have said you are a bunch of perverts you're nicked uh, and their feet wouldn't have touched the ground if you'd had any any decency about him and because th th those um, y you can't say that Muslim taxi drivers do it. you can say that I think that they're conspiring to exploit and um, gang rape young girls but there isn't a lot of thought going into it. They just group together to do what they want to do, which is to further their religion and to further uh, the war and conflict against unbelievers through um, sexual war and destruction against young um, non-Muslim girls. That's, that's just what they want. And they're grouping together to do what they want to do, and it feels nice to them. It's what they enjoy doing. It's a mistake to think that you get closer to the truth by using a lot of big words you don't. So, so the, the the question is the question that that, uh, that I uh, keep getting asked, and I was asked by uh, the, the the gentleman uh, lost in rural England, is what about some central global conspiracy like the World Economic Forum or the UN or maybe the the the, the G7? Uh, uh, if the state system collapses, won't these global organisations just step into the breach and impo impose a a UN or Basel or Geneva based um, or Davos based dictatorship upon us and then really have us by the scruff of the neck and I, I don't think that's going to happen I, I, I don't think it's going to happen because in, in brief because it relies upon the state authorities in order to, to, to th those organizations rely upon state authorities to give them power and they rely on state authorities in order to enforce their power but I'll go through that a little bit a little bit um, a little bit later. What, what, what I want to look at is um, th th this lady. Hold on, next lady. Uh, th th this is a lady that often gets referred to. Her name is um, Catherine Austin Fitz. And she she was an investment banker, and then she worked in the housing section under George W. Bush. And um, I'll, I'll pay a, about a minute or a minute and a bit of um, what she has to say. She, she says that it'll be the Bank of International Settlements, maybe. Um, supported by the, the World Economic Forum uh, imposing central bank digital currencies in order to control every aspect of our lives via our bank accounts. So I'll, I'll just play what she's got to say for a minute. All right. 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 So, so, so CBDCs are not currencies. A CBDC system is a complete control system. So back to the concept of going direct. Now the central bank is going to go directly into your bank account and control it. So they are going direct to the individual citizen, bank deposit, or consumer. And if you watch Karsten's video, what we just heard him say is, number one, it's not your bank deposit, it's not your money. It's the central bank's expression of liability, is what he calls it, which means it belongs and is controlled by the central bank. It's their money. That's number one. I think Catherine Austin Fitz is just flat wrong there. The um, Bank of International Settlements can declare anything it likes to be money. It can declare Bill Gates used toilet paper to be the currency. But if people don't want to use it, if they can't enforce it as the currency, people will pick the currency that they find um, more effective, and particularly a currency that can't be monkeyed around with by, and lose its value at the whim of someone they have no control over. I, I don't think there's, there's any chance of the, the Bank of International Settlements being able to do that. It has no army, it has no worldwide police force. Um, to the extent that it might have the power to enforce its will, it would be by national governments signing up to it and saying, yes, we like you, Bank of International Settlements, we are going to enforce what you say. We're going to use our police force and our army to make sure that it is only your central bank digital currency that gets used. And, and I don't, 
That won't happen if, as I am saying, the state authorities break down. So in answer to the question, if the state authorities break down, won't the WEF or the BIS take over and impose their dictates on us? No, because their enforcement mechanisms won't be available. They won't be able, they won't be able to enforce the will of those organisations. It might as well be the man in the moon uh, um, imposing his dictates. And the second reason is those organisations, those international organisations, they are the uh, creations of our own state authorities. They are the creations of our own presidents and prime ministers. And our, and our, our presidents and prime ministers, that they, our presidents and prime ministers don't uh, give powers away to those international organisations. They delegate some um, some decision some decision making in order to to those international organizations in order to increase their own power so that they can effectively uh, uh, say it is not well if they want to legislate for something they don't have to put it through public debate they don't have to float a proposal it doesn't have to get thrashed to death in the newspapers they don't have to try and push it through parliament uh, via MPs who are worried about their, um, their, the inconvenience of having uh, voters who might not no longer vote for them, uh, that they, they um, and, and then when it when it goes through, they don't have to take responsibility for it. And if it goes wrong, uh, that, that that they um, they can deny if it's pushed through by some international organisation, they can say it was nothing to do with me. It's not my fault. This was the purpose of the uh, the EU. If I go to to this tab, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you can you can see for, you, for yourself. If you've had the misfortune to study um, the EU or EU law, one one thing you'll realise is that all the main institutions, including I think the European Parliament, are in the grip of national political leaders. Particularly, I mean, the, the main institutions that um, are, are uh, that, that run it are, are the, the the these ones, the the European Council. And then the Council of the European Union, that's deliberate confusion. And then the European Commission. Those three are all the, the reins of control. Those, the, the, those, um, all the reins of control of, the, of those uh, uh, institutions are in the hands of national prime ministers and presidents. And the, the reason for the EU is simply to uh, uh, um, govern you by the back door the way um, the overpaid sex worker in Davos governs his billionaire client and it's uh, um, that, 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 uh, and that suits the agenda of uh, politicians it means they can get power through so much more easily and then they're just not accountable when it comes to it they can say nothing to do with me and, uh, and as an illustration of that I'd like to show you this one hold on that's um, Keir Starmer, and you see him being interviewed by the lovely, uh, the sweet, ever, ever sweet natured Emily Maitlis. So I will um, play you this, and this is this is her asking, which do you prefer, Westminster or Davos? And, and he says he prefers Davos. Um, let us just ask you quickly: you have to choose now between Davos or Westminster. Davos. Why? <laughs> because Westminster is too constrained, um, and you know it's closed and we're not having meaning. Once you get out of Westminster, whether it's Davos or anywhere else, you actually engage with people um, that you can see working with in the future. Westminster is just a, a tribal shouting place. Um, what I think he means there is you can really get up your self-serving power-hungry plans in Davos and you're mixing with people who look, think and act uh, uh, um, uh, like you and have the same ambitions as you and it's great you can dream up all these plans that increase your power and you can just push it through without any opposition you don't have the inconvenience of voters you don't have the inconvenience of public who are worried about you serving their interests and expressing that through their MPs uh, and uh, MPs who are scared of being thrown out of the gravy train window and it's just much nicer for him to operate in Davos he can do it much more freely and then when it all goes wrong you can say well it's not my fault which brings me back to this fella Matt, oops, Matt Warman, the Skegness MP, and what he said about uh, uh, how we have to take in 
all these uh, rubber dinghy invaders because international law says so. Nothing we can do about it, nothing to do with me. Okay, let me just play this bit. So, as I say, legally, we can't set people up. So what we have to do, what we have a legal duty under international law to do, just as Germany does, just as France does, just as all these other If a person claims asylum in this country, we have that duty to do. Now, so if you saw my last video, you would have seen that. And there was a previous bit where people were pretty upset about that. They didn't like him saying that. They didn't believe it for a moment. What he's, what he's saying, what he's, enjoyed, what I, what he's saying is um, it's international law. That is the word of God. Don't blame me. And that is what motivates um, politicians, the political class, um, presidents and prime ministers. It's to increase their power over us that way. Another way is, to, uh, is um, by um, at the other end of the sausage, by grinding us down. And mass immigration is a very good way to do that. It takes away your sense of identity, takes away your sense of home and um, being a part of something. And uh, it makes your circumstances of life much, much more unpleasant and makes you, renders you a lot more dependent and helpless. So, so uh, my point is, uh, our, our politicians are not going to abandon power to international organisations. So international organisations like the WF and the BIS and the UN, the, the, they, they are not going to have absolute power over us. It is always going to be exercised with the consent and the knowledge of um, um, our central governments. And if, those, if and when those governments fall over, as I think is unavoidable, primarily for economic reasons, th um, then I think those central, those um, global organisations, they just won't have any power. They'll, they'll have, um, they'll just, they'll just be like a, a circus with no clowns. It'll be an empty tent, no one visiting, no one paying any money, no one paying in any attention, no one in the circus circle, and the tent will, will just immediately fold up. And uh, perhaps to, to show this a bit further, or to illustrate, to show you something really scary that you just don't have to be scared of at all, I want to show you um, this fella. Well, there he, there he, there he is. I don't know his name. So I'll play you this a little bit. That's him recently at the World Economic Forum. And uh, there, let me just, uh, let me just play what he's got to say so that in the future it's better than it was in the past and that is about getting the major pharmaceutical people the life science people working with the regulators with the governments understanding what it is they need to do and and i also think this this issue to do with the technology and the digital infrastructure i just want to emphasize how important i think that is because in the end you you you, you need the data you need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. Some of the vaccines that will come on down the line will be multiple, will be multiple shots. So you've got to have, for, for reasons to do with the healthcare more generally, but certainly for a, a pandemic or for, um, for, for vaccines, you've got to have a proper digital infrastructure. And many countries don't have that. In fact, most countries don't have that. So again, you've got... Don't be scared of that old rogue. He's, um, he doesn't care what you think. You're not his target audience. His target audience is um, other uh, presidents and prime ministers who he wants to vote him into the big job that he thinks is fine, the big international job that he thinks is finally worthy of his talents. It's not going to happen. Uh, um, prime ministers and presidents, they want a faceless nobody that they can shove around. He resembles, to me, a trivial Shakespearean... Um, villain who is um, slowly being driven to distraction by the realization of his own destructiveness so my, over my point there is don't worry about these people uh, if if um, the system the state system breaks down uh, then as I think is going to it, it will do I think at some stage the economy will break down the debt bubble will burst um, and the state will go broke. When the state goes broke, the bad news that I keep telling you is 
you, you won't get the welfare check landing on your map, the money, you won't get the government managing the economy to keep your job, or supposedly to keep your job afloat. Um, hospitals will close their doors because they can't pay wages. You will not get, we will not get freebies anymore. And as a result of that, we will feel, my goodness, the sky is falling down on my head and we will panic and we will certainly not give any authority to um, any power. We will not allow the, the state authorities to exercise any power over us because we will see that of the state authorities as completely illegitimate because they have failed in their purpose to provide us with the goodies and freebies like free health care. And they will simply have no power. If they have no power, then the big international organisations will become completely irrelevant and they will just flop like a folded circus tent, as, I, as I've said. So I don't think there is um, any reason to worry that if the state falls over, the big international organisations take over. I certainly think that people are right to point out that there is a conspiracy. I think it is a stupid conspiracy. I think it's just trying to ride the wave, but I don't think it will come to anything. An illustration of its stupidity is that it is collapsing the state system that um, these people's uh, power trips and egos depend on. When these state systems have fallen down, the uh, when the national state systems have fallen down, the supranational state systems will fall down as well. They will not take over, not in my view. Thank you.